Good morning. Bwana Sifiwe. Thank you for being here. We are glad that you have joined us for our service today. What a blessed time we have from the presence of God. If you have your Bible, please turn with me to Acts. And for those that are visitors, thank you for visiting us. Uh, we love guests, we love visitors, so you can um, join us at the tent, the green tent outside the parking lot. You will be given more information about our church and how we run our services and any other information that you'd be wanting to know. So you're welcome there if it's your first time to visit us. We are in Acts chapter 4. We'll read from verses 13 to 31. And before that, let us ask for God's blessing before we read His Word. Lord, we thank You. We are before You once again asking for Your presence, asking that You would fill us, with your spirit, the spirit of understanding, so that your word will be divided in truth before us. We ask that our hearts will be geared to um, know you more, even as you are going to teach us your word this morning. We ask that you fill us with your spirit, even as we are going to see that you did fill these disciples again with your spirit, an indication that we are supposed to ask for your spirit every other time. So as we read your word, we pray that you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have the copy of God's word, let's read together from verses 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it, but when they had commanded them to go outside of the council, they conferred amongst themselves, saying, What shall we do to this man? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spread no further amongst the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no one in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God, to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had, for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle had been performed. And being let go, they went to their own 
companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So they, when they heard that, they raised their voices to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord against his Christ, the anointed one. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants with all boldness that they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. What a wonderful subject we have also here today, and today we are going to talk about two things, two ways, the ways of man and the ways of God. We are always at a crossroad on how to choose. We have freedom, but then we do not know how to choose things, how to appropriately think about issues, and especially issues pertaining to godliness. In Proverbs 14, verses 12, and Proverbs 16, 25, says there's a way that seems right, to a man, but its end is the way of death. There's a way that always seems right in our eyes when we look at things. When we look at the situations around us, we think this is the right thing to do. A man's wisdom does not lead to righteousness, but to destruction of their own soul. Most of the time when we are making decisions, you'll always find pride and hardness of our hearts getting on the way most of the time. You look at these people here, the Sanhedrin. They have called upon the apostles, Peter and John, to be questioned, not because they have offended the law, not because they have stolen or killed, but because they have done what is right in the sight of God. And now they are brought to question. In fact, they did miss the point when they said, and the Bible tells us here, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. They did know that they were with Jesus at the moment. It was not just a former glory, it was what was present with them even at the moment. Because sometimes we, we glory in the things that we did long time ago. You hear people say, you know, when I was a younger person, when I was this, you know, I did this, we evangelized, we did all these things. But what about right now? What are you doing for the kingdom of God? Are you actively involved in serving Jesus Christ? Or are we just still sailing in the former glory on the things that happened long time ago? Our own wisdom will not lead to righteousness. 
And Jesus had spoken to the disciple before in Matthew 10. In verses 16, Jesus said, Behold, I send you out as a sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and scourge you in their synagogues. So the things that Jesus spoke, already they are happening. You will be brought before the governors and kings for my name's sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they have delivered you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. So the men that are brought before the Sanhedrin, before the rulers and the leaders of the time, to be questioned, they suppose that these men are supposed to be afraid of them. They're supposed to have some sort of fear and tone down on their response. And we have seen that before. So that when they're being questioned, that perhaps they will say, well, we probably will not be vocal about the name of Jesus, but we'll just play it down. We'll play it down so that we can go to many other places. You know, this is how we encourage ourselves. <laughs> you know, just lay low a little bit, let the thing die, a natural death, and then we'll pick it up. That is not the wisdom from God. This is an exhortation from Christ that no matter what happens, choose to walk in God's way. Choose to walk in God's way. Not your own way. It will lead you to destruction. You won't make proper judgment when you trust upon yourself. It says here, and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could not say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside, out of the council, they conferred among themselves. So they, they, they are plotting things. And you see these disciples, the one thing that is amazing right now, after the Holy Spirit came upon them, now all these scriptures that they are quoting, they are becoming so alive to them. The, the, the one that was written in Psalm chapter 2. Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? See what the Bible says? They are plotting vain things against the anointed one of God. This has, it, it, it will not take them anywhere. So what they do, because they don't have evidence of punishing this man, they've taken them out. And this is evidence that Paul of Tarsus was amongst the Sanhedrin at this very time. For how could they have known what these Sanhedrin were planning if someone did not reveal it to them? Many scholars say, you know, after a time Luke was conversing with Paul, and Paul gave him a lot of details of what happened that day and many other instances. That is how we are able to know that when they were taken out, this is what they were thinking. To shush them. To cause them not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus, because the evidence was with them. So they, they were only praying in their hearts that this man will listen and that this thing will die a natural death. Already 8,000 men have been mentioned to have received Jesus Christ. 3,000 and 5,000. These are only men. You add up women and children, it is a lot. Thousands upon thousands. They're getting born again. And the more these people are getting threatened, 
the more the church is getting grounded. Christ is exhorting us to walk in his way because his way is right. In Deuteronomy chapter 10 verses 12. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. This is all that the Lord requires of us, every one of us, to fear the Lord God and to walk in his ways. Not the way that seems right to us, but what is right by his standards. Not our own standards. So God is not just placing a demand of things he knows we can't achieve. But lovingly calling us to a relationship that is yielding to eternity. To walk in his ways means at the end of the time we are going to see eternal life. If we walk in our own ways... It leads to destruction. Jesus says, behold, two ways are laid before you. This broad way leads to destruction. Choose me and you choose life. Imagine how kind our Lord Jesus Christ is that he brings two ways before us and he helps us to choose a better one. Choose me and have life. The way of Christ is the way of life. That means for the believer, we are born twice and we die once. Born physically and also born spiritually. And then when our flesh will die, we'll die once and we'll live forever for eternity. For the non-believer, they are only born once, physical birth, and they will die twice, a physical death and also a spiritual death. They will not enjoy eternity with Christ. Which way do you want to go? Because when these questions are brought before us, it will help us to know who your master is. You know, considering the current state of the church, when you ask, by whose authority do you do this, what will be your response? Will you say, well, I just joined the church the other day. I don't know a lot of things about it, but I'm just here. <laughs> what response will you give? Who's your master? Who's your Lord? Who do you follow? You can serve two masters. You love one and hate the other. None of us possess the capacity to love both equally. We're not able to do that. Every victory that we have is because we choose or we chose to obey our master, Lord Jesus Christ, above all else. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2 and 14, Now thanks be to God who always leads us into triumph in Christ, who always leads us in victory in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. The fragrance of Christ's knowledge being diffused in every place we go. The places you go, Christ is supposed to be known. 
not compromising for the reasons best known to us, but yielding to obey the will of our Lord Jesus Christ. For us to choose God's way, we must be vulnerable. We must be vulnerable. You see, in Exodus chapter 3, verses 10 and 12, God spoke to Moses, saying, Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Egypt. So he said, God, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God in this mountain. You see, God is using the people who are willing to be used of him regardless of what they know or what they don't know. The question is, are you willing to be vulnerable to be used of God? You read the story of Moses, we know the the trail of what happened until when God is speaking to him. That God had saved him from the waters. God used his own mother to be the nanny, the person taking care of him. And I believe he instilled some, you know, moral values from their Hebrew culture. And when he was of age, you know, he saw an Egyptian and Hebrew man were fighting for some things. He killed the Egyptian protecting his own. And maybe you would think that, hey, Moses is thinking God is interested in him him because he's a strong man. (laughs) He killed someone else. He's able to go and deliver my people. God brought this man to the wilderness 40 years to teach him a lesson. And after this, what Moses would say is, God, who am I? You know, until we come to the point where we can say, who am I, God? Then we'll not be used of him. If we haven't come to that point yet, it means we are still full of ourselves. God, I can do it. God, I'm well able to tackle this. He said, who am I? Who am I? And you see, God in the history, we see a lot of times, he comes to people, and especially those who think less of themselves, he will use them. You think highly of yourself? Continue sitting there. He came to Gideon and called him a mighty man of valor. And he said, why why do you call me that, considering my family is even the least in our tribe? And I'm the least in in my family. Why call me mighty man of valor? God always wants people to get to a point where they can say, who am I, Lord? And until you come to this point, you should be aware that you're still full of yourself. You haven't let go. When you come to God in humility, these are the words you will hear. I will be with you. In humility you come to God, this is what you will hear. God said, And I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign. 
He'll provide you with a sign. When you are vulnerable, when you are humble before Him, when pride has been destroyed. And you see, when God is doing that, when God is sending Moses, He's actually leading him to places where he feels inadequate. The people that God is using, normally he sends them to places where they feel very inadequate. Even when Jesus is sending them, sending them as sheep amongst the wolves. <laughs> A people without the strength and the wisdom of the world, and then he sends them there. Say, do, do not even take an extra coat. I will be with you. In other words, God wants us to trust him from A to Z. Trust him all the way. Don't rely on your own understanding. God will always lead us in places we feel inadequate so that his name will be glorified and that we will grow in him. When you are in the state of inadequacy, you will trust God. God for everything. Whether it's for 10 shillings or a million shillings, you will learn to trust in Him. Therefore, the state of inadequacy is a good place to be when serving the Lord. Just don't give excuses. Oh Lord, my speech is not updated. I cannot say this. I cannot stand before these people. You remember what Jesus just told them? When you are called upon, don't be worried. Don't be concerned of what or how you're going to do it. Right at the moment, the Holy Spirit will be with you and He will prompt you on what you are to say or what you're supposed to do. The question is, will we trust the Lord that much? Will we trust the Lord? They said, what shall we do? So the, the people who are not followers of God, they're asking, what shall we do to these men to stop them? But a real believer will ask a question, God, what can I do for you? Send me, Lord. I'm available. What shall we do indeed? Because an audible miracle has been done through them, and it's evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. That is why the Bible says that these people, they are plotting things that are in vain. They are plotting vain things. Why do you want to deny and in fact, you know, the, their biggest trouble is that the people know it and the people are praising God for it. What will people think about us? I mean, we come to the temple and read the scrolls to people and then we are against the same God. People won't take us serious. It is very dangerous to have Religious leaders who are not born again. <laughs> Spiritual leaders who are not born again. They have nothing of the Lord. They're not following Jesus. They have their own way. So they, be, they become the enemy. They think they know God, but they have no relationship with Him. So they were trapped in their own ways. They were unable to deny the miracle because the evidence was there. It is important to know that the miracle in it itself was not the proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The miracle and the message in the context of all that had been going on since Pentecost was extra evidence that Jesus Christ was alive and was at work in his church. 
The fact that these leaders, the Sanhedrin, were having trouble with this miracle is a proof that miracles alone can never convict or convert the lost sinner. I mean, how many miracles have people experienced out there? Yet we still have dozens of sinners, people who have not turned to the Lord. If this was sufficient, we couldn't have one person not born again. But this was an indication that Jesus Christ was alive and that he was working in his church. So when you see men parading miracles, especially, you know, those of healing, be warned. Rarely will people invite us to just go and sit and listen to God's word. Because they think it is inadequate, it is not powerful enough. We have to be enticed with miracles. Come experience healing. Come experience deliverance. Come and see the blind see. The lame will walk. The dead will rise up again. Do you know what? Whether they are resurrected from the dead, they will die again. If they have no Jesus in their lives, they have no eternal life. And these things are so touching to us. We hear them, we run straight to these meetings. We run to them. Be warned. Evangelical meetings should primarily be based upon God's word. And thereafter, the Holy Spirit will visit the people as he so desires. We cannot untwist God to do things. God can choose to heal someone today. And he can also choose to heal that person in two years to come. It's within his right. This man was born crippled. He's over 40 years. Think about it. Did Jesus go to this temple before? (laughs) Probably Jesus saw this man not one time. (laughs) Many times. Was he healed those times? Nope. He was healed later on. God can choose to heal us today or tomorrow. He is just in whatever he does. Also be warned when men are exalted above God's word. All we see is men exalted, men exalted. It's not God's word. God's word is not exalted in our lives, in the things we do. 2 Timothy 4 Three, the Bible says, for the time will come when they will not endure or put up with sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their eyes away from the truth and be turned aside to fable. We want people who will say the things that we just want. Like, that, that was hard. I want someone who will just encourage me. That will just exhort me. If we don't find exhortation in God's word alone, I don't know how that will be sufficient to us. There is enough encouragement, friends, in God's word. There is enough, enough to repeat for the whole year and begin again. Which way do we want to go? Which way? This they conferred 
amongst themselves, saying, What shall we do to this man? For indeed, a notable miracle has been done. Everyone knows it. But so that it spreads no further amongst the people, let us severely threaten. <laughs> this is the best way the, the whole council of the Sanhedrin came up with. <laughs> this is all they got. Let us threaten them so that it will not continue any further. I don't know if this seems familiar with what we have experienced for the past maybe three years. <laughs> A lot of threats to the church. Don't say these words. Close the doors for the safety of the people. If you love one another, then you separate from one another. This is the message from the world. And you know what? The church did listen. And after the church listened to that voice, what happened? suicidal or people who committed suicide the rate went high depression all these things because why people were separated from one another if the church is to remain alive she must be vocal we must talk. We must preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. The enemy from the beginning has always tried to silence the people of God. And in my, many matters nowadays, sadly, the enemy has succeeded. There's a philosopher called Albert Kama said, what the world expects of Christians is that the Christian should speak out loud and clear in such a way that never a doubt, never a slightest of doubt could arise in the heart of the simplest of a man. Speak it. Loudly. Speak it with conviction. Speak it so clearly that people will not go ahead doubting God. So loyalty to Christ must be accompanied by respect to his word. Therefore, we at all costs must speak the word. Charles Spurgeon said, We have received the truth from Mardia's hands. Shall we not defend it? We have received this word from men and women who bled for it. Shall we just shut our mouth and forget about things? What are we here for then? If we can't speak it out. Regardless of the threats, we have to make decisions. Our decision should be made on the basis of, is it right and not, is it popular or is it safe? Because that is the model of the world. Is it popular? If it's not popular, don't talk about it. Is it safe? I mean, is, is the place safe? <laughs> Are we safe around here? We should open the Bible and respond appropriately. If it's right, we're going to do it. If it's not, we ain't going to do it. Even if it will mean 
you lose the things that you have. You know, many people are not, they are afraid of, you know, losing their position. Guard your faith, not your position. Above all else, these positions, they come and go. Because I am so and so, I am Reverend Bishop so and so, and the government approached me, they said this is what I ought to do. So I'm going to tone it down so that I'm in the good books. I want to be politically correct. But see also, here we see the urgency of sharing the gospel. One of the greatest prayers was birthed out of the witness and service of the Lord. You see, when they went back to their own people, always have a people that you can fall back to. They went back to the company of their own people and they shared what had happened. Verses 24, so when they had heard that they raised their voices to God with one accord. And they said, Lord, you are God. You see how even the, the, the way they begin their prayer, the way they present these prayers to God, saying, the Lord your God. I know we are in deep, distressful moment of life. We are troubled. They want us to shut up. They don't want us to preach in your name again. But Lord, you are God. You made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And they went ahead and spoke of this prophecy. It said, For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. In other words, these things that are happening, they don't know that they were predetermined ahead of time. <laughs> They're speaking of the sovereignty of God. That God is all-knowing. God planned it all. And God uses whoever he chooses to. He can use a man. He can use a donkey. Whatever he chooses to do, he is within his right to do it. And so when they're doing all these things, these leaders of the world, the thing, you know, they're, they're making this to stop. Yet they did know, it's like they're adding fire to it. This was predetermined by the hand of God. And they said, now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants with all boldness that they may speak your word. <laughs> when they gathered to pray, they prayed according to the scriptures. In other words, prayers and God's word, they got together. If you pray according to the word, the Bible tells us that God honors his word above everything. So are we going to pray? These people, they were praying according to what God had said before. These believers did not pray to have their circumstances changed or their enemies be put out of office, rather they ask God to empower them. And what a beautiful prayer. They didn't say back to sender. They didn't say, oh, we kill them. <laughs> you know, Holy Spirit, we pray that wherever they are, they shall see no peace. Wherever they are, get them out of the office. All my enemies shall not see peace. They will not enjoy that job. They will... I don't know if you guys have had this kind of prayers. People do them and we think they're very spiritual. No, they didn't pray. 
You know what they prayed? They pray that God would grant them boldness that they would speak God's word. <laughs> it is the boldness that these two men had in the courtroom that caused this council to release them. Like, what, what are we to do with this bold man? They say, you know, what are we being judged for here? Did we steal so that we are judged by you people? Are we being judged for doing a good thing to this helpless man that we are going to rot in the courts for doing good? That is not how it works. And the Bible says they prayed, they strengthened their hands to God, and God heard their prayers. It says when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Friends, when you pray the prayer and God answers it, do what you ask for. Because many people will ask God for things, will go to God in prayer, that God, if you would be merciful and grant me this, and give me this, and give me this, in turn, I will do this. And as soon as we receive that which God has given to us, that which we prayed for, we do the exact opposite. God, give me a job, and I will continue serving you. As soon as you have the job, you never show up to church anymore. You, don't, you say, God, I will serve you with everything I got, including my money. And then when you get money, we only find you in Rupa. <laughs> in the malls, that is where you're rolling. Life's good. We do the exact opposite after the Lord has blessed us. You see what happened with these people that after they were filled with the Holy Spirit, this is not the second um, Pentecost. And this is an indication for every one of us that we ought to pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit daily. You cannot do anything without the power of the Holy Spirit. Then you will be deceiving yourself. Ask that you be filled daily. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they did what they asked for. After the Holy Spirit filled them, the Bible says, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. They spoke the word of God with boldness. When God answers your prayer, do exactly what you prayed for. Don't try to, you know, it's like we, we are bribing God. If you do this to me, I'll do this. If you do this, the preacher man warns us, Solomon, he says, do not be hasty making a vow when you enter the house of God. For if you do not fulfill your vows, it becomes a snare to you. It becomes a sin. And sin brings about death. Do not just say things for the sake of saying things. Do not promise people even. People will talk to you and you, there's a need and you're like, let, let me see what I will do. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. The, it, nowadays, it's not a polite language. It is a, just a way of getting out of people's presence. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do. And then they disappear and they never pick your calls. They do nothing about it. I'll see what I can do. Tony Mambo. <laughs> I see what I can do. No, don't, 
don't say words just for the sake of pleasing people. If, you, if you're not in a position to help people, be honest. You cannot help the world. Be rest assured. <laughs> you cannot help everyone. You can only help so much. And the one thing that we also see from this man is that they gazed upon eternity that the current situation didn't matter a lot to them. So if we gaze upon eternity, what we have down here becomes a means by which we glorify God with. You look upon him, he provides things, use those things to glorify him with. You will not have such an influence and power if you're not gazing upon the throne of God. You cannot have such an influence on people's lives if you're not gazing upon the throne of God. And you know, many people who heard them, they believed. We'll continue with the, uh, the, the, the next verses that are driving into the next chapter, talking about a very important subject. You know, people ask, but how is it that we're not seeing, you know, the, the move of God as we read in the book, book of Acts? We don't see people being healed. We don't see thousands of people getting born again. If we'd be honest and try to see around the globe what God is doing, we'll know for sure that God is working, that the Spirit of God is at work. Do you know how many people in the world get born again? every day. We don't have counts. Many people were getting healed. We don't have counts of them. But because we are in a specific location, we think that, man, every, every week we are supposed to see a blind man see, a dead raised, so that we see that there was a power of God. No, we have the power of God changing people's lives, transforming our hearts. People ge being geared to follow God and to love God daily. We see a lot of things happening in people. We've seen miracles of hearts being changed. And even when these things are happening in the church, we, we have those who will just be always in the flesh, like Ananias and Sapphira. They, they sold their properties and they lied about it. And they were struck dead. We shall discuss it next week. You think about it. God is working in the church. People are bringing their belongings at the feet of the apostles. And it's being distributed as much as people had need. But we have those who also are being not honest. I'm going to keep this for myself. The land was theirs, by the way. <laughs> they had all the rights to keep it all for themselves. But why lie that I brought it all? Yet they knew that they were hiding things. And when they were struck dead, everyone feared. <laughs> you look at these emotions, you know, someone has been healed, is now walking, and someone lied about things, they're struck dead. What are people thinking about the church at the moment? <laughs> when the Holy Spirit is present in our lives, in the life of our church, 
will see lives being transformed. Living your old life and asking the Holy Spirit to lead you so that you don't make decisions that are just based on your feelings, what you feel, but not as grounded on the truth of God's Word. As I bring the worship team to come, you know, thinking about this part of the Scripture, and we see it every time, that when Peter begins to preach, he's making them aware of what was written in the time past. It was written, it was written, it was written. When they are praying, they are also saying, it was written, it was written, it was written. If we will pray according to the scriptures, perhaps we will see changes in our lives. If we'll pray according to the will of God, perhaps those things that are stuck with us, that are not changing, they will change because God honors His word above every other thing. When you're threatened, what are you going to do? And remember, this might be your civil leaders, civil authorities, what are you going to do about it? Say, well, the Bible also encourages us to honor the authority, which it does, but it has to be in context. What are they telling us to do? Are they telling us to shut up? For what reason? If you shut up, we will not experience the power of God. If you speak out, some will die, but the church will grow. You know what Jesus said? That the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. I am never afraid of what people would do. They take me down. I know they'll not prevail. If they take me down, it means that God allowed them to. The blood of the martyrs became the seed of the church. The more they died, they were mocking them, hanging them on the poles, and calling them, you know, the lights of the world. And for sure, <laughs> their lives became the light because they showed people the right way to do things. Grant your servants boldness that they may speak your word. This is my prayer for us today, that the Lord will grant us Boldness, as we study his word, that will not depend on our strength, will rely on his strength. Amen? Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your word that is alive and sharper than any double-edged sword. We pray that as we continue to meditate and think about it, I pray that in us and through us, you will do exceedingly abundantly above what our thought are able to handle, above our imaginations, through the power that works in us, your power, not our own. I pray that you will empower us to be witnesses to the world, to the rulers of the world, to our colleagues at work, to everyone, Lord. We have all these opportunities, and we have prayed that, Lord, you'd open doors for us. Surely you have opened doors. 
Some of us have been running away from these open doors. Some of us have drove right into them. And I pray that you grant us boldness. Boldness like a lion. For your word says so, that the righteous are as bold as a lion. We do not have our own righteousness. It is what proceeds from you. And so we ask collectively as a church, as individuals, that you grant us boldness to be your witnesses, Lord. And even as we give to you this morning, help us to give to you a percentage that is glorifying to you. We thank you, God. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.